Nearman Condition, the home of Collected oh, Edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. How's it going, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for my overview of all these Marvel books coming out this week. So let's go ahead and get started. And welcome back, everybody. Now, before going any further, I do want to thank David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us advanced copies of all of these books. All of these books are due out in the direct market and book market on September 5th or 6th, depending on where you get your books, with one exception. And that is the Avengers Marvel Masterworks. I was supposed to come out with a video, but for some reason, files got corrupt. I had a new laptop. It didn't transfer over. Regardless, I'm still going to show it off this particular week. But that one did come out last week. That is the remasterwork, so the reprint of Avengers Masterworks Volume 1. All right, we've got the ending of an ongoing series right here, and also the beginning of the series in a thicker format. We've got all of Mariko Tamaki's She-Hulk collected in one book, the beginning of a new series, a big game changer, and then, of course, I'll be talking about my pick of the week and why, and then a couple of Marvel Masterworks, or, I'm sorry, Mighty Marvel Masterworks. These are the same book. And then one epic collection. So let's go ahead and start with the Mighty Marvel Masterworks. So this particular week of September 5th or 6th, we are kicking it off with the Mighty Marvel Masterworks. This is the Incredible Hulk Volume 3. And you'll see it there. Uh, this is the direct market version. So this is the classic cover. The spines look different. And also the back is different. This is a limited print run. And this is Volume 26. Has there been 26 of these already? Wow, my kids and I need to catch up on these. I think Namor's the one we're working on now. Uh, so this collects Tells to Astonish 75 to 91. And it's been a while since I got rid of my Mar uh, Marvel Masterworks of Hulk. So I think the mapping is a little bit different. Now the Hulk has been sent to the distant future. And he comes back in this particular volume. And he finds out that his friend, or once friend, Rick Jones, has pretty much revealed to the world that the Hulk was Bruce Banner. Because he thought that his friend was dead. So now he has to come and pretty much set the record straight. Uh, now we have the Submariner sharing the title with the Incredible Hulk in the Tales to Astonish. However, it is just the Incredible Hulk that is collected in here. One of the biggest fights happens through these pages, and that is the fight with Hercules right here in Tales to Astonish number 79. So sometimes he's on the cover, and then sometimes it's Namor on the cover. But I do love the fact that regardless of who's on the cover, the cover is intact and collected in here. Uh, the other big thing that happens in this particular volume is the coming of this guy that you see on the front there in this standard edition cover. And that is, of course, the Abomination. Uh, this is another person that got impacted by the gamma rays and this time around he's not using his powers for good so he's another big green goliath and this is towards the end right here so here is where he becomes the abomination and then the next issue is all about fighting this particular character and the hulk trying to take him down with of course general thunderbolt after him the entire time uh now this one doesn't have any extras. Usually they have one or two pages. This is 192 pages. It retails for $15.99. And if you're not familiar with the Mighty Marvel Masterworks, these are digest-sized books, meaning the dimensions of the books are just a little bit smaller than that of a regular-sized trade paperback. Captain Marvel, Volume 10, Revenge of the Brood, Part 2. This is the end of Kelly Thompson's run on Captain Marvel. And I know I leave timestamps in the description of the video because of 
books like this because this is the end and I don't want to spoil anything that's happened before for anybody that hasn't read it they're waiting for the omnibus or they're waiting for the fat trade collections uh, so in case you haven't read it I'm just gonna flip through some pages here not going into deep spoilers but I do have to talk about certain things especially on the cover here <laughs> that are happening and where this leaves Carol Danvers and what she's been up to to kind of show off uh, the art through these pages. So Kelly Thompson wraps up her run in a very interesting way. There's this huge battle that doesn't even take place in on Earth. It takes place in outer space where they go and try to rescue Binary and Rogue that have been taken by the Brood. And of course the Brood have always had this small part to play in the transformation from Carol Danvers to Binary. However, in the previous volumes of Kelly Thompson's run, we've learned that Binary has separated herself from Carol Danvers and become its own sentient being, if you will. Uh, so she is separated from Carol. Carol has to stay behind. Meanwhile, the Brood Queen is trying to keep Carol there at her side at all times. And it comes to this big, brutal finish that you can find out for yourself how it wraps up. Issue 50 is a beautiful aftermath issue. I really liked how everything is tied nicely, including some elements from Captain Marvel, the end. Uh, we see Hazmat and we see Jessica Jones. Uh, we also see Jennifer Walters, characters that have played a big part in the life of Carol Danvers. And of course, Monica Rambeau, joined by Jessica Drew here too. So it's nice to see that these characters from the beginning of Kelly Thompson's run, have played a big part and still to the very end stuck around. There's a nice, beautiful goodbye letter from Kelly Thompson, but we're going to be looking at the extras here where she talks about pretty much her time on the book and what it meant to her. 50 issues these days, I know it's kind of crazy for us old readers, you know, for Gen X people, not Generation X, but Gen X folks, uh, our age rather. Uh, you know, we were used to long runs, people being on books for 10, 15 years. That was kind of not that big of a run, seven years, five years. 50 issues wasn't a lot for us, but nowadays 50 issues is huge for somebody to stick on one book. Uh, but here's the extras, including the variant covers. The book has 112 pages and retails for $15.99. Red Goblin. This was a really solid read. I don't know if anybody has read this in single issues, but this spins out of the events of Dark Web. And again, just minor spoilers with the first issue here. I'm not even going to give away the ending of the first issue, but just to give you the pitch, I have to talk about what the Red Goblin is or who he is during these particular pages because you're going to find out by even just looking at the pictures. All right, let's take a look together. This kind of gives you a quick little, and I mean quick synopsis as to what the Red Goblin symbiote was. So during the Dark Web era, which happened right before this, Dylan decides that, this is Dylan Brock, he needs help. He needs to fight, uh, find his father, Eddie Brock. So what he does is give his friend, Normie Osborne, the grandson of Norman Osborne, the son of Harry Osborne, a symbiote. And the symbiote that Normie calls Rascal is now not fully bonded with Normie. But Normie's out there trying to do the right thing. And he has no control over the symbiote. So it's almost like he, he described it as a puppy dog. So in the events of Dark Web, that's when all this started. Of course, the Red Goblin had been around before in the pages of Dan Slott's Spider-Man when it was bonded to Normie's grandfather, Norman Osborn. So we have a new Goblin Nation that keeps talking about a new Goblin King. Now that was an idea again by Dan Slott. And later on it was brought back in the pages of, was it Zeb Wells for a little while? But now we have a new Goblin King. And the Goblin King seems to know exactly who Norman Osborn is. So we see some flashbacks here through the mind of Rascal, again the symbiote. And it's a flashback when Normie found out that his father had passed away. His grandfather and mother are talking about how daddy's not coming home, he's there with his brother, and it is Rascal that steps in and he's like, hey, what are you doing in here? I'm sleeping, where are we? So he wakes up at this convenience store where he just broke in and ate all of this chocolate. Because apparently, according to Normie, that's what symbiotes enjoy, is chocolate. And they're also afraid of fire. 
So it is a very interesting read because he's trying to break away from that legacy of the Osborne name. But even Norman Osborne is trying to break away from that legacy. He's trying to redeem himself in the pages uh, of the current run of Spider-Man. Who knows where we'll be if you're watching this video five years later or so. But it's always this thing that comes and haunts him. He knows about demons. He knows about monsters. So when the Goblin Nation approaches the new Goblin King and tell them that there is a new red goblin out there the goblin king just seems to think that this is norman osborne's way of destroying them and keeping them down that they have to strike at the heart of everything so much so that he's just going nuts and killing his own people and he's dressing everybody up again like goblins and what he wants is he wants the blood of norman osborne and i don't mean in a metaphorical way i mean he literally wants his blood for a reason. Now, of course, the blood is tainted with that goblin serum, so he might want something to do with that. And this is also a scene where Normie is trying to talk to Rascal about, you know, there are certain rules that you can and cannot do. And you don't eat people. That's the rule. You can eat chocolate. It's really cute. It's it's a interesting relationship. It's a lot different than, you know, when we've seen Spider-Man with the symbiote or Eddie Brock with the symbiote or Cletus Cassidy with the symbiote. He's so separated from that, he doesn't even know about the King in Black or, or things like Absolute Carnage or the Codex. All he knows is that this thing is like a puppy dog that doesn't listen to him and it's not well behaved. So the symbiote has to stay home like a bad dog while he goes with his mom and brother to his father's... Well, it's named after his father. It's called the Harold Osborne Addiction Treatment Center. And this is when the Goblin Nation attacks and kidnaps Norman Osborn. And Normie can't do anything because he left the symbiote underneath his bed. So the Goblin Nation takes Norman Osborn back to the new Goblin King. And in issue number two is where you get to find out exactly why the Goblin King wants that blood from Norman Osborn. Now we also see a big fight here between the symbiote and the gold goblin. And all of this leads into this carnage event. Um, with a, It's a big crossover. I think it started this summer, so it'll be collected in trade paperback later on. That has Miles Morales and it has Iron Man in there. And of course, Peter Parker. And that is the Carnage Rain event. All the way in the back is where you're going to find some variant covers. Some of these variant covers are on the opposite side of the standard covers. This book has 120 pages, collects the first five issues of the Red Goblin and retails for $17.99. Venom by Al Venom Volume 4 Illumination. I'm just going to go ahead and say if you've not read Donny Kate's run on Venom and you haven't read these first three volumes of Ram V's and Al Ewing's run, do not even let me flip through these pages. Move on to the next book, which is Captain Marvel by Kelly Thompson. Uh, because I have to talk about what happened previously in order to explain why I chose this as my pick of the week. Holy crap, did this just blow my mind? My buddy Peter M. was on my show last Thursday. And we talked about the upcoming Marvel Collected Editions, and it's Venom Volume 5, and I was like, you know, Venom started okay, and then it just, I don't like it. And he was like, just keep reading. And this is what happens. Oh my gosh, this goes in a completely different way than I thought it was going to. All this written by Al Ewing, Ram V has stepped away from the character of Venom. I think he has a contract now with the Distinguished Competition. So now it's Al Ewing writing the entire story. Uh, we have Cafu doing the artwork with Roge uh, Antonio and Pere Perez. This is in the aftermath of Dark Web, but that's really not that important to talk about this. Now, I'm not going to go deep into spoilers, but I am going to mention some things that happened previously and why I freaking enjoy this. I did not see this coming. So this collects issues 16 through 20 of the 2021 Venom series. Uh, the stories that were kicked off by Ram B and Al Ewing, and it was drawn by Brian Hitch. So in the aftermath, or during Dark Web, rather, Chasm ends up sending Bedlam to another place, a place beyond that of Limbo. And if I haven't explained who Bedlam is, 
because I don't want to spoil that precisely for people that haven't read volumes 1, 2, and 3, because it is all explained. All I will say is that Bedlam is also part of the symbiote. He's also part of Venom. He's also a big part of Eddie Brock, and I'll leave it at that. And when he is sent to Limbo, it's this amazing trip that if you've been reading Marvel comics for a long time, this is when Al Ewing starts flexing his knowledge. Because he is sent to Limbo during a time when demons were infected by the techno-organic virus uh, from Magus, um, Warlock's father, through the pages of New Mutants 40, 47, 48, and 49, 50, uh, when they made a deal with, um, uh, what's his name, not Despair, Sim, that was who was over Limbo during that time, and... It's really interesting to see him. So you know that Limbo works in different ways. We know through the Magic Limited series that time works differently in Limbo. And we see that he's kind of flickering in and out through different times of Limbo. Here he's being attacked by the techno-organic virus. And they come in contact with him, which means they can take over his body. Now this has happened before, right? We've seen it happen in a way with Cable and he's able to control it with his telekinesis. Uh, we've seen it happen to Ileana, Magic, and she's able to just wipe away the techno-organic virus with the Soul Sword. But now that Eddie, or Bedlam, has a new status quo after the King in Black... His powers are going completely cosmic. He's able to just wipe that virus away by just making it go away. Just flexing. That's exactly what he's doing. He's just ripping it out of his body. And then we see this character right here, Darkoth. Uh, this is a character that first appeared in the pages of the Fantastic Four. He's ruler over Limbo right now. So again, he's flickering into another time. And this is where it gets really interesting. Because this is the way that Limbo works. And the art is just phenomenal by Kafu because what they do is they split the story. They tell you the story of Darkoth versus Bedlam. And Darkoth wins in one story and Bedlam wins in another. And this is really weird because I was just thinking, wait a minute, I just saw this guy in another book. It was in the Thor book. I think it was issue 26 or 27 in the recent Thor run where he has the techno-organic virus. Or no where he has the symbiote attached to him. And so what ends up happening is, in the part where Darkoth wins, he rips that symbiote away from Bedlam. And the symbiote, of course, tries to take over Darkoth, who magically disappears through a disc right there. We probably are familiar with that disc uh, if you've been reading X-Men for a while. And this is where he ends up going, yeah, right here, to Thor 27, which came out, I think that volume came out, Last No, no, it was at the beginning of this year. Uh, but yeah, and then that leaves Bedlam dead, maybe. And then you see the story where Bedlam wins. Again, Limbo working in different ways. Leaving Eddie falling. And where is he falling to? This is where, holy crap, I did not see this coming. Because yes, this is cool, right? It's like, okay, Al Ewing knows this is Darkoth. He's the character that appeared in the pages of Excalibur when they went to Limbo. Uh, so cool, cool. But this just went to, oh, holy crap, this is Immortal Hulk level of storytelling. And I'm serious, if you don't want to know anything else, go, go, just go to the next video, go and read this. But do yourself a favor and read the first three volumes because it's that slow start. It's what I always tell people, don't jump to the good stuff. Read through the slow things, read through the not so good stories so you can appreciate stories like this. I'm trying to teach my kids the same thing, which is why we're going through Dragon Ball Z uncut none of this kai nonsense they need to go through all those episodes all right so i'm not gonna go into details but this is where all the answers come from uh now we know the identity of meridius we know about the different venoms this is where this hand is asking eddie you know what is he doing here and he has five questions to ask you know of course the first question is like how's my son and he shows him a glimpse of his son fighting the gold goblin and he's like okay cool you've got four questions left and the questions that he's asking oh my gosh the answers that he's getting is kind of if you go back and reread some of those volumes the previous volumes to this they've been hinted at this for a long time so after the events of the king in black eddie has now become the new king in black but he's not using his powers right he passed away he died and Dylan is now the new Venom. 
So through here, it is explained exactly who Meridius was, who all those venoms were that he saw in that room that, you know, at first it's kind of confusing. And are you like, is this the afterlife? Is this the future? Is this another universe? Where the hell is Eddie Brock? Everything is answered, I promise. And here he learns the full potential of the King in Black and the choices and how alike to Noel he is. It is freaking mind-blowing. It is God-tier level of storytelling. This is the stuff that I enjoy about comics. For a character like Venom to come, you know, and don't get me wrong, I love Donny Cates' run on Venom. I think it's great. I love the introduction of the King in Black. I like villains that are one-dimensional that have no reason other than to kill. But this changes everything, including why Noel was the way that he was and the potential of Eddie Brock in the role of the Marvel Universe. And we do have a big crossover coming out, the Gods crossover, with Jonathan Hickman at the helm. And I'm wondering if all of this will be tied into that. I mean, we are talking about cosmic level type of powers here. And you can find out for yourself exactly the details, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Because I think this is a book that a lot of people, including myself, have been like, eh, it's okay. Or, ugh, I can't wait till the next writer but no, now that Al Ewing is single-handedly writing the stories, I'm in. I can't wait to see where this goes now. Because, I mean, that was a game changer. That was like Immortal Hulk 25. If you've read that, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, here are some variant covers. This book has 112 pages and retails for $15.99. And now comes the portion of the video where I remind people to smash that like button while we check out all of the spines of the books coming out this particular week. With again the exception of Avengers because that came out last week. But also to ring that bell for notifications if you're enjoying these type of videos we do put out videos every day. Alright let's carry on with the overview. Captain Marvel this is the Kelly Thompson Volume 1 book. So it's not a complete collection. It's not an epic collection. It is just Captain Marvel by Kelly Thompson, Volume 1. Uh, we call them fatties around here, even though it's not really that thick of a book. It's issues 1 through 11. But it's kind of like these saga books that Marvel has been putting out. They're big books and just they don't have a title or anything outside of Captain Marvel by Kelly Thompson, Volume 1. Uh, there is no subtitle like there normally is with the thinner volumes, but this collects Captain Marvel 1 through 11 and Captain Marvel the end. Carmen Carnero doing the internal artwork, who actually wrapped up issue number 50 of Kelly Thompson's run. Uh, so now we have a new era of Captain Marvel. This is after the Kelly Sue the Conic run. So this is when Kelly Thompson brings the character and it puts her more into her own little I don't want to call it a pocket universe because she's still with the rest of the Marvel characters but I love the way that she writes Carol I think it's her voice that I really enjoyed and it's my favorite run of Captain Marvel that features Car uh, Carol as Captain Marvel and of course my favorite Captain Marvel is Janice Vell but you know, it just never really clicked with me, the character of Carol Danvers. Uh, none of the runs before this, I didn't even like the Brian Reed Miss Marvel run. I don't think he really understood the character of Carol Danvers. And I know people really love that run. Uh, but yeah, I was never a really big fan of that run. Uh, but this kind of reminds me of the way that Chris Claremont or Kurt Busiek wrote her character. And maybe that's what I enjoyed about it. So here we have some new supporting cast not really new because she's been friends with these folks for such a long time she's still part of the avengers during this time and uh Rhodey plays a bigger part in this has matt from the pages of avengers academy and of course her friend jessica drew uh we have this character named the nuclear man who shows up right here this is ripley ryan who plays an important role uh in the first story arc who's a reporter for a magazine uh she's writing a story about her and the nuclear man ends up fighting Carol Danvers and then taking her into a not so distant future where she's fighting a revolutionary war. So this first story arc is really interesting because she's fighting a big war in this possible future where you're going to see some familiar faces. You're going to see her max out her powers 
And it's all for this revolution that she's playing a big part in. And it is a long story. That goes on for a while. Uh, now, when she comes back to present day, or present day during this particular time of 2019, uh, there's a team up with the Black Widow and Doctor Strange where they have to take down the Enchantress here. And that storyline lasts the... Um, a couple of issues and then we have a new character that is the villain of this particular storyline and that is star who wants to just bring shame to the name of captain marvel she wants everybody to know how much of a hoax she is that she's always been a fraud and that star is the real hero of the story and then we get captain marvel the end which is really cool because i was just reading the final part of the Kelly Thompson run and she brings it all together so this of course shows a possible future where Carol is now a lot older and a lot of her friends are dead and she's kind of become one with her powers and you can find out exactly what I mean by that by reading the book this particular book has 296 pages and retails for $34.99 this is another one of those big fat trades that really don't have a subtitle with them this one's 360 pages this has been previously collected before in a series of three trade paperbacks and see this is what i mean the smaller trades do have deconstructed a subtitle these really don't this is just she hulk by mariko tamaki um now this is after the events of civil war 2 not civil war 1 and what is collected in here is hulk 1 through 11 and she hulk 159 to 163 and that's i think that hulk issues those came out in 2015 no 2016. so you have art in here from nico leon bacan and georges duarte and julian lopez and francisco gaston and federico blee janoy lindsay just to name a few of the artists i've always been a fan of these covers here by nikon all right so it's very important to note that this takes place after the events of civil war ii so if you haven't read civil war ii God bless you. <laughs> That's all I will say. I'll leave it up to you if you want to read it or not. Something happens in Civil War 2 that affects the character of Jennifer. So, in the first story arc, don't expect a lot of She-Hulk. It's a lot of Jennifer. As a matter of fact, She-Hulk doesn't even show up until, I think, the final issue of the first story arc, which is issue number 6. So, she is dealing with PTSD because of the events of civil war ii something happened something was taken from her in civil war ii and she's dealing with that and that's a really you know before heroes in crisis before you know tom king took over a lot of books and started writing a lot about ptsd we never really saw that in the way that some of these characters dealt with uh death or loss uh, so this was a really interesting take because we're used to the She-Hulk that breaks the fourth wall, the She-Hulk that's funny, the She-Hulk that goes on cosmic adventures only to go on trial with things that don't really amount to anything and make fun and poke fun of the distinguished competition. Uh, you know, talking about, of course, Dan Slott's run and John Byrne's legendary run. This is a lot different. This is more of a serious take. As a matter of fact, it goes into some dark territory. It gets pretty depressing. The, and then that that's just the first story arc and this is of course patsy walker her friend hellcat she takes on cases including this one right here this is macy who has her own secret uh she's being evicted and she needs help she needs legal help and you can find out what i mean by uh, her own secrets when you read the book uh the second story arc <laughs> this is when i think mariko tamaki started having fun with the book this is when we do have now Jennifer Walters turning into She-Hulk. Like I said, in the issue number six, she turns into She-Hulk. I really like the design of her, too. She's got those scars. This cover right here is by Del Keon. But in this, she's starting to come to terms with her hulking out into this new alter ego. And this is when an internet cook ends up turning into a big creature, like a game, uh, game, uncanny Omar Talk Pretty One Day, a gamma radiated creature just like uh abomination and now she has to go and try to find him uh, but my favorite issue through here is where her and patsy walker just go uh this one here issue number 11 this is where both of them just go on dates and they talk about their experiences this is what i want out of she hulk just fun 
stuff like this. Uh, this is what I liked about the, the stuff that John Byrne did, the stuff that Dan Slott did, and in a way, the stuff that Peter David did. I think, for the most part, the book took itself really seriously, um, and it is a little depressing. But I think by the time you get to the third story arc uh, is when Mariko Tamaki starts having fun. This is where she gets kidnapped by one of her biggest fans. And of course, the leader takes a big part in this. And then let's look at the back here. Looking at the extras here. This book has 360 pages and retails for $39.99. That's an awesome cover. That's a Mary Jane variant. Yeah, I like the designs. I like the gamma scars on her. And that is She-Hulk by Mariko Tamaki. Loki, the modern epic collection, volume two. This is Everything Burns. And let me tell you, um, doing a pick of the week is so unfair sometimes because I, I've read this and this was, as soon as I saw what was coming out this particular week, I was like, this is it. This is the one. Because the ending of this still hits every single time. The story in here is so amazing. Um, but that Venom, it just came out of nowhere. I was completely blown away by that story. So, uh, had not been for that Venom, had that come out at a different time, this would have been the pick of the week. So, what is collected in here? Well, this collects Journey into Mystery 637 to 645, Exiled One Shot Number One. New Mutants 42 to 43, and then the Mighty Thor 18 through 21, and then the material from A plus X number 5, which is an amazing story that only Kieran Gillen could have uh, written. Uh, it features Sinister and Kid Loki. All right, so we, we see the New Mutants. They start taking a, a part in this because it's the return of a particular Asgardian character and his nine brides. And by the time these characters return, you see that a lot of the gods from Asgard have forgotten who they are, such as Thor. Now, I've always liked this because it always reminds me of Adventures in Babysitting. Whenever, uh, what is it, Vincent D'Olofrio was uh, playing the garage, uh, the, the guy that owned the garage that fixed their car, and the little girl thought it was Thor. And then, of course, later on, he went on to play a Kingpin. But anyway, I don't know if they did that on purpose, maybe. But it is a crossover with the New Mutants and helping the gods restore their role in Asgard. And that one is called Exile. And we immediately go from that to another big story arc through here. And that is the Everything Burns storyline, which is the big crossover with Thor. And it's really interesting because this is still... Now you got beautiful artwork in here by Alan Davis. This is still Kieran Gillen able to tell this amazing story arc featuring Kid Loki... While in the middle of these two crossovers, one of them being a huge crossover with Everything Burns. And oh my gosh, like I remember when we did an old reader, new reader on this, you can tell like when Matt Fraction is writing the Thor parts, just how that was a different type of story than what Loki is doing with Leah. And everything comes out. Everything comes out. Every little bit of mystery that has been in hey in journey in a mystery that you've been wondering about who really is leah what's gonna happen to kid loki you know what is the answer to kid loki oh my gosh and that ending is so beautiful and heartbreaking when you realize what it means um but that's all i will say about it if you've not read this and you don't own them do yourself a favor, pick up these two, because I think where they go from here will probably be, I don't think they'll collect Young Avengers like this, well, I don't know, maybe, uh, definitely, you know, all the other modern Loki miniseries, or the Agent of Asgard will probably be collected in a Loki modern ep epic collection, uh, but this goes and ends, and then the story you read in Young Avengers by Kieran Gillen is a continuation of some of the things that he started here, but oh man, that ending still sticks, all the way in. No, actually, before we look at the stuff in the back, I just want to show you the beautiful artwork by Stephanie Hans, who provides the art for the final issue of Journey into Mystery 645 in this beautiful moment. Uh, but yes, there's also the Mr. Sinister and Kid Loki story back here. And then we're looking at the extras here, the back matter. This book has 392 pages, and it retails for $39.99. Some of the layout for the covers and internal artwork right here. 
It's been collected in omnibus format, but this is the first time it's being collected in a modern epic. And of course, these were originally complete collections. Last but certainly not least is the Marvel Masterworks The Avengers Volume 1. This is the Remasterworks. And again, like the other Masterworks, it comes with a dust jacket and this beautiful faux leather right there on the hardcover. And collecting the Stan Lee, Don Heck, Jack the King, Kirby era of The Avengers. And of course, inks right here by Dick Ayers, Paul Rainman, George Russo, Sam Rosen doing the lettering. That was one of my favorite letters growing up. Um, he passed away, my goodness, a few years. Uh, that's been maybe over a decade now. And then colors, of course, uncredited for the time. You do have the wonderful introduction by Stan Lee right here talking about why the Avengers were even formed. And it's interesting because, yeah, it makes sense, right? Like, they kept getting letters like, hey, when are you guys going to get these guys together again? I really like when they fight for no reason. And Stan was like, why don't we just develop a book that has these guys always together? That way we always have a team-up book. And that's where we got the Avengers. And honestly, the writing sometimes felt like, why don't we just have a team-up book? And that was it. The Avengers are brought together by Loki, much like the story in the movie. So they are brought together by this guy named Loki, the god of mischief. But I'm pretty sure most people know that story already. We do have Tony Stark now donning his new outfit there, the Golden Avenger. Uh, there's the Phantom from Space right there, the Space Phantom. Next issue, the Avengers feature the Submariner. So this is when the Hulk and the Submariner go and fight the Avengers. And like I said, this collects the first 10 issues. And I appreciate stories like this. No matter how many times I've read this stuff, you know, um, it, it's always like a big historical lesson for me. This, of course, being probably the most popular Avengers story out of any of the ones here, and that is Avengers number four, which is the return of this classic Golden Age character. So they were testing the waters with Namor in his return in the Fantastic Four. And they thought, well, why don't we bring in this guy? There's something missing from the Avengers. And I've always loved that. That is a beautiful picture there. Um, let's bring in Captain America. So in a little bit, of a retcon they bring him back they say that he was frozen on in like in ice and the avengers bring him back to fight an alien that is kind of like medusa that is petrifying people and captain america ends up joining the team and then we have the invasion of the lava man who come back a little bit later now we have tony stark with his new outfit but he had his own title and so did thor and so did captain america and so did the hulk uh but those were the Tales to Astonish, Tales of Suspense stories right there. And now we have one of my favorite stories that not a lot of people talk about, but this is the Masters of Evil. This is Baron Zemo, a character from the Golden Age, but is it really the original Baron Zemo? Coming here with his new Masters of Evil, like the Melter and the Black Knight and Radioactive Man. There's the Executioner with the Enchantress and Baron Zemo. And that storyline goes on for a couple of issues. And then Kang the Conqueror making an appearance. My favorite Avengers villain. I talked about the Kang Dynasty last week. If you watch my videos every week. Thank you all. Don't forget to smash that like button. Uh, but this is the big appearance of him. Not as convoluted as later on when you know the character is tied into Immortus. And he's tied into Ramatut. But... Definitely his appearance nonetheless, and there he is, speaking of Immortus, a villain like none other. And that ends this particular Marvel Masterworks. I've talked about these stories thoroughly in the pages of the Avengers Omnibus Volume 1, if you want to go back and see that. But let's see what's the extras back here, because I think that's what really matters to a lot of people. So we have, if you can't beat them, join them. It's an introduction from the Sun, yeah, Sun of Origins Marvel Comics. We have some house ads here, original pages by Jack Kirby and Dick Ayers. This is the Marvel Superheroes annuals. We've reprinted some of these early stories. And then prior to Captain America's actual return, the Human Torch battled a criminal Cap imposter in Strange Tales number 114. With that story in mind, the original cover copy of Avengers number 4 included a caption reassuring readers that it featured the real Captain America the real Captain America lives again. I guess that was like the real Ghostbusters. 
Pipes, Alex Ross's rendition of issue number four. And then we have the Essential covers. Now, this is another one that I got rid of many years ago. I don't think it included this, the Ace edition. But maybe later reprints did. Uh, this is the Fantastic First 2002 cover. So this is the extras that were included that were not in the original ones. Uh, Avengers Classics right here. Reprinting those classic issues of Avengers. I always like the big head that Arthur Adams gave Kang right there. Wonder Man. I didn't even talk about Wonder Man. And then the Avengers Omnibus Volume 1 reprint or cover right here that was not in the original Masterworks. The trade paperback cover. The all new, all different cover, including the sketch variant. The Mighty Marvel Masterworks, the 1963 Omnibus cover. And then, of course, the biographies. This particular version has 280 pages and retails for $75. And that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first-time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below if you're beginning your journey with the Marvel Masterworks, if you're just keep keeping up with the epic collections, or you're sticking to the classics, or you're going to do any of the modern, what you think about some of these runs if you're reading them in single issues, or if you're waiting for them in trade paperback, without going too much into spoilers. Uh, but yes, this thing was a huge game changer, making it the book of the week. But that's it, everyone. Stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.